I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 1, Chapter 15, The Nature of Art. Session 1 Topics Why Art? What is Art? How Art Works? Paradox 1, Empathy and Psychic Distance, and The Willing Suspension of Disbelief. Deepening one's understanding of what art is in general must help to deepen one's appreciation of Shakespeare's art specifically. Hence, I offer the three sessions of this chapter on the nature of art. Its relevance will soon become clear. The main ideas are those of the late Mary Holmes, painter, professor of art history, cultural historian, and my greatest teacher. In much of what follows, I am quoting or paraphrasing from her lectures, writings, and conversations. Why Art? Human life is paradoxical. We are thinking, self-aware beings living in physical bodies in the physical world. This joint being, consciousness tied to physicality, causes us no end of mystification. It yields rich complexity of experience, but also, inevitably, frustration. We are amazed that our bodies can do a whole range of remarkable things, from breathing and reproduction to decathlons or playing the violin. And at the same time, we are frustrated that our bodies can't or won't do what our minds imagine they might, like flying or never sleeping or having a tea party at the bottom of the sea. Because we have imaginations that take our thoughts beyond our body's limits, we are always striving to get our bodies to catch up, to give physical reality to images in our minds. We cook dinner not only to have something to eat, but because we can imagine the pleasure and satisfaction of eating and perhaps sharing a tasty meal. We practice layups because we can imagine making the perfect shot or winning the championship or maybe impressing a girl or a scout. We learn to drive because we can imagine getting to work or to the beach in a car. We sit more or less still in classrooms because we can picture our parents reading our report cards or the life that learning might bring us or the pleasure in having our conceptions expanded or relief in having our questions answered. Anyone who has been in love knows what it means to strive to realize a mental image. Because our bodily experience is so powerfully present to us, and because our minds can imagine all sorts of things that we can never experience in our bodies, we find it hard to believe in the reality of anything that is only a concept in the mind. If it is not also present to our physical senses, how can we be sure that it is any more than a fantasy? This is why seeing is believing. Whether it's an abstract idea, like winning the game, or a memory, like your first birthday party, or a future hope, like becoming president, or an ideal image, like your future wife or husband, or a divine being, like an angel or God himself, unless we can physically sense it, we can't quite believe in it. At the same time, we all know that our senses can be fooled. That lake on the desert road ahead turns out to be a mirage. That heavy ceramic bowl turns out to be light plastic, and so on. But here, too, the senses, along with reason, are called upon to confirm or deny our mental pictures. I can know about optical illusions, but only stepping physically into that lake proves to me beyond a doubt that it was a mirage. I didn't get wet. Only my hands lifting that plastic bowl confirmed that my eyes misled me into thinking it was heavy ceramic. Except in the most abstract of human enterprises, like logic or mathematics, only seeing, that is experiencing with the senses, is believing. But this condition is a frustrating predicament if the concept is not easily perceivable by the senses, and such is the case with the vast majority of our concepts. The past cannot be retrieved, 
The distant cannot be embraced. The hoped-for future cannot be grasped in the present. The ideal can rarely, if ever, be realized in the world of space and time. The invisible is invisible. Because only seeing is believing, people make art to confront this predicament. The work of art brings into the realm of our physical experience what would otherwise be an unbelievable concept. You make a word picture about winning the game, a snapshot of your first birthday party, a journal entry about the desire to be president, a novel about the perfect or perfectly awful wife or husband, a poem about your distant beloved, a painting of angels, a psalm about God, all in order to make the idea accessible to sensible experience. We will not live without images that make real to our senses that which we imagine or hope or desire or believe. We want to see it. Therefore, as Mary Holmes says, the purpose of art is to make the invisible visible. Because all human beings need the invisible to be made visible, since only seeing is believing, human beings simply will not live without art. For this reason, at all times and in all places, wherever there have been human beings, there has been art. What is art? After a lifetime of thinking and teaching about art, Mary Holmes concluded that the only trustworthy definition of art is anything made by a human being. If a human being didn't make it, if it was made by nature or divine creation or accident, it's not art. If a human being made it, then it's art. These statements at first seem uselessly general, but really they convey a deep truth. Anything made by a human being is art because anything made by the human hand exhibits the choices of the person doing the making. Here's Mary Holmes' example of how you can test the truth of this definition of art. Imagine the following. You are walking along the beach with a friend who picks up a beautiful shell to show you. You notice the shape and the intricacy and the color and the texture and so on. You see its beauty and are moved by it. Now, suppose the friend says, You know, that shell I just pretended to find on the sand? It's actually man-made let's say, by Tiffany and company in the 19th century. What just happened to your inner feelings? They did a sudden flip-flop. Knowing that the shell was made by a human being, you now see and feel and judge it in a completely different way. Your wonder at nature's handiwork becomes a different kind of wonder. Now it's wonder at the handiwork of the human artist. Everything we know to be made by human beings evokes from us that second kind of feeling, interest, and judgment. And that is why anything people have made we call art. But though everything made by a human being is art, that doesn't mean that everything made by a human being is good art. It means that everything made by a human being is an attempt to make an idea, an image in the mind, accessible to our physical experience in the body, through seeing, a painting or a photograph, hearing, a piece of music or a school bell, touching, a jacuzzi or the rosary beads, tasting, a fine wine or a tiny plastic spoonful of the new flavor at the ice cream stand, or smelling, a perfume or a garlic basil pesto. Not only great paintings or plays or cathedrals but the chair you're sitting in, and the clothes you're wearing, and the dishes you eat from, all are chosen by human beings to be made as they are, and to look the way they do, whether for practical use, or for aesthetic effect, or for both. And each man-made thing reveals in its form the choices, both practical and aesthetic, that went into making it. Those choices may be good ones or not. And so the work may be anything from a complete success to a total failure, great or hideous, or anything in between. 
That is why it is silly for people to use the word art as a form of praise. That painting my niece made was a real work of art. Well, yes, it's art, all right, because she's a human being and she made it. But is it any good? How does art work? Just as we ourselves are paradoxes, minds mysteriously tied to bodies, so art works on us through four basic sets of paradoxes. Paradox 1. Empathy and Psychic Distance The basic foundation of all art is empathy, meaning feeling into. Our empathic response is that capacity we all have to feel into what we are looking at, to intuit meaning in form. We are always exercising this capacity whenever we are seeing or hearing or tasting or touching or smelling anything. When we see something, we are also feeling what it feels like to feel the way it feels. Let's say you see someone walking along and suddenly crack his shin on the corner of a bench. What happens to you? You feel it. Not in your body. You're not going to have the other person's bruise on your shin. But you feel it in your mind's version of your body. Your inner life experiences a mental version of that pain, and you experience something very like what the other person is feeling. You might even wince. That's empathy. It's not just the idea of his pain, or the understanding of it, which you also have. It's the direct, immediate experience of it inside yourself that precedes any idea about it or reaction to it. Another example. You're sitting in the theater, and at a certain point, you feel that a silence on stage has gone on a little too long. You realize that one of the actors has forgotten his or her lines. With each passing second, the silence gets heavier and heavier. How are you feeling? Uncomfortable? Anxious? Starting to squirm? Why? You're not the one on stage being totally embarrassed. You're sitting in the dark among hundreds of other people, none of them looking at or thinking about you. And yet you feel the actor's agony as if it were your own, and you can't wait for it to end. That is empathy. When you see a smile or a frown, a limping person or a scampering cat, in fact anything with a visible physical shape, moving or still, you empathize into it, knowing, in your own mental version of your body, what that shape or movement or gesture means, because you know what it would mean if your own body were in that shape or were making that gesture. The same is true for hearing. The resolution of a piece of music on the final tonic chord means one thing, a fingernail on a blackboard another, and you know the difference in meaning just by hearing them, even just by reading or hearing the words that describe them. A tap on your shoulder can mean friendliness or threat, and you can usually tell which it is by the feel of the thing. Empathy is the power to experience and recognize meaning in form and we are empathizing all the time. One day every year, Mary Holmes would come into the classroom and make two drawings on the blackboard. Since I can't show them to you, I will have to describe them, although if you're listening to this on YouTube, I will try to post those two lines in the video. Both lines are abstract. One is angular, erratic, confused, tangled, crazily going in all directions at once. The other is a single curvy serpentine line, like the line of a smooth flowing river on a map. Suppose you came into the classroom and saw these two lines on the blackboard. And suppose I told you that the smooth serpentine line represents chaos, disorder, confusion, anxiety, and frustration, and that the crazily tangled line represents simplicity, elegance, smoothness, easiness, and calm. You would say that I was crazy, or lying, and you'd be right. How do you know? 
Your empathic response to the lines tells you so, even if you have not seen them being drawn. Because all form has meaning to us simply by virtue of the physical things we are. Even if we can't put into words what the lines mean, even if we come from entirely different cultures or different periods of history, the crazily tangled line means the same thing to all of us, as does the smooth serpentine line, simply because we have bodies that are shaped in certain ways and experience the world as they do. Despite the varieties of our physical and cultural experiences, the basic human empathic response is universal, which is why we can appreciate works of art made by people from far away and long ago, an ancient Chinese vase, say, or an Egyptian pyramid, or the Parthenon. Not only visible images have meaning and evoke our empathy. Close your eyes for a moment. Now just feel what it feels like when I say the word butterfly. You and every English speaker listening will have an empathic response very different from the one you'll have, keep your eyes closed, when I now say the word hippo. That difference in the way we feel in response to the words and their images in our minds is evidence of our empathy. We know what it feels like to feel like a butterfly, though we've never had wings, and what it feels like to feel like a hippopotamus, though we'll never weigh 3,000 pounds. And because of that, we associate the feelings we get from the words with the feelings we get from the things they signify. So, our empathic response to a word is a combination of the feeling evoked in us by the image the word calls up in our minds, and the feeling evoked by the shape and sound and spelling and image of the word itself, which, once we have learned a language, we associate with the thing the word signifies. All art depends upon these empathic responses to images, sounds, and words. If we are not empathizing into the meaning of the forms in a work of art, we feel nothing. We don't get it, and we're not moved. Being moved depends upon empathizing into what is moving us. When you are watching Shakespeare's Othello smothering his innocent wife Desdemona, you are feeling both what it feels like to have your hands on that pillow on that face and what it feels like to be suffocated under that pillow. You empathize with Othello and with Desdemona. You also empathize with the pillow, all at the same time. You just empathized into the word suffocated, too. And the horror of the dramatic moment depends on your doing so. Now, you don't like being suffocated, or want to be murdering your wife, or to be murdered. So if you are empathizing into the way Othello is feeling doing the murder, and the way Desdemona is feeling being murdered, why don't you jump up at this point in the play and shout, Stop! Your wife is innocent. If you are empathizing into the characters while watching Star Wars, what keeps you from drawing your lightsaber and rushing to help defend Luke Skywalker from attack? The answer is the other half of Paradox 1. It's called psychic or aesthetic distance. It is the awareness, even while you're thoroughly empathizing into the scene, that it's only a play or a movie. You know that if you do shout out at Othello, the actors in the play will stop what they're doing and everyone in the theater will be looking at you. The play will be interrupted and ruined. If you draw your own lightsaber, first you'll realize that you don't have a lightsaber because there's no such thing, and then you'll be thrown out of the movie theater for disrupting the show. The illusory world of the play or movie will be destroyed, and you and everyone else will come crashing back to reality. Very naive people, including young children, do such things, but you don't. And the reason is that you have psychic distance. Even while you are empathizing, you have the awareness that what you're seeing is art and not life. 
Thus, all art depends just as much on psychic distance as on empathy. If we did not have that distance, we would not be able to value any quality in a work of art. We wouldn't know it was art, something made by human beings. Remember that seashell? We would treat it as if it were life and would behave very differently in relation to it. Imagine that you are staying in a hotel room with thin walls and that in the next room you hear a man and woman arguing and then hear what sounds like the man killing the gasping woman. Your impulse would be to break in on them or call the police to stop the violence, and so you should. But how embarrassed would you be if you did break into the room, or the police did, and then found that the man and woman were actors rehearsing the last scenes of Othello, that the murder you thought you were hearing was a play rehearsal? You were empathizing into a work of art as if it were life. Have you ever bumped into a department store dummy and started to apologize, only to discover that it wasn't a real person? Once again, you were empathizing into a work of art as if it were life. Your psychic distance was missing, and when it came flooding back, you felt like the dummy. In order to make sure that we don't react to a work of art as if it were life, every work of art must establish psychic distance in its audience. The work of art must do something to make sure that we know it is art and not life. And it does so by making boundaries. Painters put frames around their paintings so we don't try to walk into them. Music has rhythm so we notice that it is a different thing from the sounds of the everyday world. Statues are painted, made bigger or smaller than life, and placed on pedestals. All these things tell us to expect to experience not life, but a work of art. What happens when you ask a question of the guard in a wax museum and then discover that he, too, is made of wax? The artist has intentionally removed your psychic distance for a joke. But there's no joke until your psychic distance returns and you realize your initial error. Plays, especially, which have the greatest danger of being taken for life because they are made of live people actually moving around and talking, use many means to establish psychic distance. You pay to get in. You get a program that tells you which fictional people the real people will be portraying. You sit still in rows in the dark while the actors, often wearing unusual costumes, move around in the light on a stage either higher or lower than you, and so on. All these conditions make sure you know that what you're watching is art, not life, so that you will remain silent and not destroy the play. The coexistence of these two paradoxical forms of human perception, empathy and psychic distance, is essential to the appreciation of art. And you can see why by imagining what would happen if someone had all empathy and no psychic distance. Let's say someone watching Star Wars or Harry Potter empathizes totally with Luke Skywalker or with Harry Potter and loses all psychic distance. When he comes out of the theater, he thinks he is Luke Skywalker or Harry Potter and spends the rest of his day or his life wielding an imaginary lightsaber and believing he is living on some distant planet or wielding his magic wand and believing he is casting spells. We would call him mad, and rightly so. He would be treating art, the movie, as if it were life. He would have all the empathy the movie maker could ask for, but not nearly enough psychic distance. And the opposite is also a form of madness. Suppose you're visiting your friend's house, sitting in the living room and watching TV, and your friend's parents come in having a fight, and your friend's father takes a pillow and, like Othello, starts to suffocate your friend's mother. What would it mean if, Instead of screaming or calling the police, you sat watching the scene, saying to yourself, Wow, this is exciting. I wonder how it's going to turn out. You would be treating life as if it were art. 
it would mean that you had an excess of psychic distance and not nearly enough empathy. Empathy and psychic distance are not exercised separately in time. They are both working at the same time in harmony with one another. At the very same moment that we are horrified by Othello's act of murder, we are aware that we must not say a word, but must just keep watching and listening. And the meaning of the experience, which depends on both capacities in us, comes through our exercising them unconsciously together. Related to this paradox is what has been called the willing suspension of disbelief. That is, the agreement every member of the theater audience makes to treat the characters and events on stage as real. Empathy does not depend on this suspension of our skepticism. We are empathizing with the characters whether we choose to believe in their reality or not. But the willing suspension of disbelief in their non-existence, in other words, choosing to pretend they are real for the time being, allows our capacity for empathy to work deeply and consistently. Here's what I mean. If, sitting in the theater, you keep telling yourself that the person playing Othello is an actor, and the suffocating of the actress playing Desdemona is not happening in reality, you will still be empathizing, but you won't let yourself care very much. You won't be getting the full force of the empathic experience. You are holding on to your psychic distance too much. If, on the other hand, you let yourself believe in the reality of the action, always knowing at the same time that it is a work of art, then the events receive your fully committed attention. Your engagement will be much greater, and the experience will have far more meaning. The willing suspension of disbelief allows us the joy of escape into the story. That brings us to the next paradox, which I will discuss in session two in the next podcast. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.